are going to treat you to a cold lunch at Meryton Inn, but you must lend us the money, for we have just spent ours. <laughs> oh, look, I have bought this bonnet. I do not think it is very pretty, but I thought I might as well buy it as not. It's very ugly, is it not, Lizzie? <laughs> yes, quite ugly. How can you have thought it worth buying, Lydia? Oh, but there were two or three much uglier in the shop. Besides, it will not much signify what one wears this summer. For the militia are leaving us. Our hearts are broken. We are going to be encamped near Brighton. I do so want the party to take us all there for the summer. And we think what a miserable time we will have else. Anyway, let us hear ha what has happened to you both since you went away. Have you seen any pleasant men? Oh yes, have you had any flirting? <laughs> we were in great hopes that one of you would have got a husband before you came back. Jane will be quite an old maid soon, I declare. <laughs> Lord, how I should like to be married before any of you. And then I could chaperone you to all the balls. Oh, what fun that would be. <laughs> nothing of that. Who should suffer but myself? It has been my own doing and I should feel it. I'm not afraid of being overpowered by the impression that it will pass soon enough. Do you expect them to still be in London, sir? Yes, where else can they be so well conceived? And Lydia always used to want to go to London. She will be happy then and her residence there probably of some duration. Lizzie, I bear you no ill will for being justified in your advice to me, which considering the event, shows some greatness of mind. <coughs> I should like some tea, Miss Lizzie. Nobody cares for my suffering. Of course we do, my dear. How could we not when you remind us of them so often? <laughs> Another time I will do the same. I will sit in my library in my nightcap and powdering gown and give as much trouble as I can. Or perhaps I will defer it till Kitty runs away. I'm not going to run away from her. And if I should ever go to Brighton, I would behave better than Lydia. You go to Brighton? I would not trust you so near it as Eastbourne. <laughs> no, Kitty, I have at last learnt to be cautious and you shall feel the effects of it. No officer will ever enter the house again. Balls will be absolutely prohibited unless you dance with one of your sisters and you will not be allowed to stir out of doors until you can prove to me that you have spent at least ten minutes of every day in a rational manner. <laughs> oh, well, well, do not upset yourself. If you are a good girl for the next ten years, I will review matters. Mother, father, a carriage has arrived. It is my uncle and he has some people with him. My dear sister, brother, they are found. <gasps> and they are now married. <laughs> As you may comprehend, it's all been carried out rather quickly. But I have them both outside. Will you admit? They can only stay for a brief visit. They're travelling northward. Oh, my dear Lydia, married at just 16. <laughs> this Brother, is delightful indeed. Tell me the truth. How much have you had to pay to make this happen? No, indeed. Mr. Wickham's circumstances are not so bad as was generally believed. I, I assure you I did very little. Almost nothing. Truly. <laughs> Well, well, you, ha you had better bring them in. Can this be true? I am so glad. Perhaps it will be happy after all. part of your family, sir. I am much delighted. Well, Mama, and what do you think of my husband? Is he not a charming man? I'm sure my sisters must oh. all envy me. They must all go to Brighton. That is the place to get husbands. But what a pity, Mama, that we cannot all go. Well, my dear Wickham has a commission in Newcastle. We are on our way there now. 
Are you and Papa and my sisters? Let's all come and visit us there. I dare say we will have some balls. And I shall get husbands for you all before the winter is over. I thank you for my share of the favour, Lydia, but I do not particularly like your manner of getting husbands. It was such a lovely ceremony. Only it was so very small, you know. Though I always think small ceremonies are nicest. Still, it is a pity, however, that none of our friends could attend. Why, in the end, we only had my aunt, uncle, and Mr. Darcy, all of them scowling away. Mr. Darcy? What was Mr. Darcy doing at your wedding? Gracious me, actually, I quite forgot. I ought not to have said a word. It was to be such a secret. Did yeah, <laughs> Come, uh, you must introduce me to the famous Hill, uh, who you said has always been such a friend yes, to you. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Won't Hill be surprised to see me return a married woman, Mama? <laughs> Aunt, Uncle, how came Mr. Darcy to be at Livia's wedding? Were you truly unaware, Lizzie? We thought you knew. Why, Mr. Darcy, it was a discovered the niece. He left Derbyshire directly after we did, with the express purpose of hunting them down. He claimed that it was entirely his fault that Mr. Wickham's true character hadn't been known, and he insisted on making amends. I, I confess I did not pay a penny to bring this marriage about. Mr. Darcy did it all, paid off Wickham's debt, got him a commission, and settled money on him, enough to make it worth Wickham's while to marry Lydia. He was most insistent, though, that no one should know of it. And although it means breaking my word, I am very relieved to be able to own the truth to you, my dear. It was not easy having all the credit without having done anything. We would not have let Mr. Darcy take so much upon himself. Had we not suspected he had another interest in the case? <laughs> I assure you, Aunt. No matter, Lizzie, no matter. <clears throat> we can wait, especially for news which would make us so glad. May I just say how much I like him? His behaviour to us in every respect has been pleasing and unassuming. proud of him. I defy even Sir William Lucas himself to produce such a valuable son in law Oh, my poor Lydia. I often think there is nothing so bad as parting with one's friends. And this is the consequence you see, ma'am, of marrying a daughter. It must make you better satisfied that your other four are single. <laughs> there is no such thing. Lydia does not leave me because she is married, but only because her husband's regiment happens to be so far off, that's all. You must all take care to marry men who live in the neighbourhood, that's all. Mom. It's seeing Miss Lydia, I quite forgot to tell you the news. I saw Miss Nichols, the housekeeper at Netherfield, in the market this morning, and she told me that her master was coming down in a day or two with a hunting party to shoot there. Mr. Bingley! Oh, well, what was I just saying, Lizzie? Not, of course, that we have any interest in such news. Mr. Bingley is nothing to us, you know. I'm sure I do not care what he does. By the <coughs> by, we, I must see what meat we have in. You don't look at me like that, Lizzie. I assure you, this news does not affect me without a pleasure or pain. I am glad of one thing, though, that he appears to come without his sister, because then we shall see less of him. Oh. Not, not that I'm afraid of myself, but I dread other people's remarks. I suppose it is hard that the poor man cannot come to a house he has legally rented without raising speculation. That is just what I think. I am sure that when we meet, it will be harmless, as common and indifferent acquaintance. Yes, indifferent indeed. Jane, take care. You do not think me so weak as to be in danger now, Lizzie. I think you are in very great danger of making him as much in love with you as ever. Mr. Darcy. 
party. Well, any friend of Mr. Bingley's will always be welcome here, I am sure. What else I must say, I hate the very sight of him. Jane, come here. Congratulate you all. Of course, it is very hard to have her taken such a way from me. But they're going to Newcastle, a place quite northward, it seems. There they are to stay, I do not know how long. His regiment is there, for he has gone into the regulars now. Thank heaven he has some friends. Though perhaps not as many as he deserves. Do you mean to stay long in the neighbourhood, sir? A few weeks, at least. Well, when you have killed all your own birds, Mr Bingley, I beg you come here and shoot as many as you please on Mr Bennett's manor. I'm sure he will be happy to oblige you. Is your and sister so still at Pemberley, Mr Darcy? Yes. She will remain there till Christmas. And is Miss Bingley with her? I do not hope she has not been left quite alone. Caroline is in town. She is sorry not to be able to see you all again. Particularly you, Miss Bennett. I am sorry not to see her. We have missed the society of our friends at Everfield since she went away. Mrs. Bennett, I wonder if I might have the honour of speaking with Miss Bennett alone? Yes, yes, of course. The, the, the breakfast room is empty, I believe. I beg you will excuse me. I have some urgent business with my steward. Good day, Mrs. Ben. Oh, girls! <laughs> Mr. Bingley is finally going to propose. Did you see he could not be in the same room with her for more than five minutes before he had to speak with her alone? <laughs> Did I just see Mr. Darcy leaving? He looked in as fine a mood as ever. Where is his friend? Speaking with Jane alone! What's this? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bennett, I must speak to you quite urgently. I believe I may anticipate you, Mr. Bingley, and say with all sincerity and gladness that I give my consent. <laughs> Jane, I congratulate you. You will be a very happy woman. I have not a doubt of your both doing very well together. You are each so complying that nothing will ever be resolved upon, so easy that every servant will cheat you and so generous that you will always exceed your income. <laughs> exceed their income, my dear Mr. Bennett. What are you talking of? He has four or five thousand a year. Oh, my dear, dear Jane, I am so happy. I knew how it would be. I was sure you could not be so beautiful for nothing. <laughs> I am so very happy for you both. I could not wish for a better brother. I hope you will fall forth in the field every winter. There could be no harm to dance in my own sister's home. And After all, may I use the library? I've heard it's one of the finest in the country. I'm sure we'll be happy to receive you all. Where did Darcy go? He said he had business to attend to. Was it not so, Lizzie? We must have a drink to celebrate, I am sure. Yeah. Oh, my dream. I do hope that Mr. Darcy does not disapprove of your decision, Mr. Bingley. Disapprove? Not in the least why he encouraged me to come today. Oh, but I, I thought... Darcy and I discussed the events of last autumn, Miss Bennett. And I can assure you of his full approval of my marrying your sister. <laughs> now, I had better go and start endearing myself to my prospective in-laws. <laughs> How shall I bear so much happiness? Oh, Lizzie, I could see you as happy. If there was such another man for you, <laughs> if you gave me forty such men, I could never be as happy as you are. Until I have your goodness, I shall never have your happiness. But perhaps in time, if I am very lucky, I may find myself another Mr. Collins. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Catherine to Bird, ma'am. Miss Bennett. 
Bennet, that lady, I suppose, is your mother. Yes, she is. Mama, this is Lady Catherine de Bourgh. These, I suppose, are two of your sisters. Uh, yes, madam. These are my youngest girls but one. My, my youngest of all is lately married, and my eldest is walking about the grounds with her betrothed. Miss Bennet, there seems to be a prettyish kind of wilderness by the side of your lawn. I should be glad to take a turn in it, if you would favour me with your company. Yes, of course, Lady Catherine, if you wish. Miss Bennet, you can be at no loss to understand the reason for my journey hither. Your own heart, your own conscience must tell you why I am come. Indeed, you are mistaken, madam. I am not at all able to account for the honour of seeing you here. Miss Bennet, you should know that I am not to be trifled with. A report of a most alarming nature has reached me. I am told that not only is your sister on the point of being most advantageously married, but that in all likelihood, you, Miss Elizabeth, will soon afterwards be yourself united with my nephew, Mr. Darcy. Though I know this must be a scandalous falsehood, I instantly resolved on setting off for this place to make my sentiments known to you. If you believed it to be impossible, I wonder that you took the trouble of coming so far. What could your ladyship propose by it? At once to insist upon having such a report, universally contradicted. Oh, your coming so far to Longbourn to see me shall rather be confirmation of it, if indeed such a report is in existence. Oh, do pretend to be ignorant of it. Are you not aware that such a report is spread abroad? I had not heard that it was. And can you likewise declare that there is no foundation for it? I do not pretend to possess equal frankness with your ladyship. You may ask me questions which I shall choose not to answer. Miss Bennet, I insist on being satisfied. Has he? Has my nephew made you an offer of marriage? Your ladyship has declared such a thing to be impossible. Well, it ought to be so, but your arts and allurements may have made him forget what he owes to himself and to all his family, you may have drawn him in. If I have, I shall be the last person to confess it. Miss Bennet, do you know who you are talking to? I am almost the nearest relation he has in the whole world, and I am entitled to know all his dearest concerns. <laughs> but you are not entitled to know mine, nor will such behaviour as this ever induce me to be explicit. Let me be rightly understood. This match to which you have the presumption to aspire can never take place. No, never. Mr. Darcy is engaged to my daughter. Now, what have you to say? Only this, that if he is so, you can have no reason to suppose he would have made an offer to me. The engagement between them has been planned since they were infants. It was the favourite wish of his mother, as well as of hers. Are they now to be divided by the upstart pretensions of a young woman without family, connection or fortune? Your alliance would be a disgrace. Your name would never even be mentioned by any of us. Those are heavy misfortunes indeed, but I believe the wife of Mr. Darcy would have other sources of happiness attached to her situation. Obstinate, headstrong, I am ashamed of you. You are to understand, Miss Bennet, that I came here determined to carry my purpose, and I have not been used to brooking disappointment. <laughs> Well, that will make your ladyship's situation at present more pitiable, but it will have no effect on me. Is this to be endured? If you were sensible of your own good, Miss Bennet, you would not wish to leave the sphere in which you have been brought up. In marrying your nephew.
nephew, I do not consider myself as quitting that sphere. Your nephew is a gentleman, and I am a gentleman's daughter. True, you are a gentleman's daughter. But who is your mother? <laughs> and who are your uncles and aunts? Do not imagine me to be ignorant of their condition. Whatever my connections may be, if your nephew does not object to them, they can be nothing to you. Tell me, once and for all, are you engaged to him? I am not. And will you promise me never to enter into such an engagement? I will not. I am no stranger, Miss Bennett, to the particulars of your younger sister's unfortunate elopement. I know it all, that the young man's marrying her was a patched up business. Is such a girl to be my nephew's sister? Heaven and earth are the shades of Pemberley to be thus polluted. <laughs> you can now have nothing further to say. You have insulted me in every possible way. You are resolved then to have him? I am resolved to act in a manner which will constitute my happiness without reference to you or to any person so wholly unconnected with me. Very well. I shall now know how to act. I take no leave of you, Miss Bennet. I send no compliments to your mother. You deserve no such attention. I am most seriously displeased. <laughs> Exceedingly sorry that you've ever been informed of it. I did not think Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner so little to be trusted. Oh, you must not blame them. It was Lydia who first betrayed to me that you were concerned in the matter, and of course I could not rest until I knew the particulars. Let me thank you again and again, in the name of all my family, for they do not know to whom they are indebted. <coughs> you will thank me. Let it be for yourself alone. Your family owes me nothing, much as I respect them. I believe I thought only of you. You're too generous to trifle with me. Your feelings are still what they were last April. Tell me so at once. My affections and wishes are unchanged. One word from you will silence me on this subject forever. My feelings. My feelings are completely changed. told me of her meeting with me. I believe it had quite a different effect to the one she intended. It taught me to hope, as I had scarcely ever allowed myself to hope before. I knew that had you been absolutely, irrevocably decided against me, you would have acknowledged it to Lady Catherine quite openly. Yes, having abused you so abominably to your face, I could have no scruple in abusing you to all your relations. Did you say of me that I did not deserve? My behaviour to you at the time was unpardonable. You are proof. I shall never forget. Had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner, you know not how those words have tortured me. 
I had not the smallest idea of there ever being felt in such a way. I can easily believe it. You thought me devoid of every proper feeling. I'm sure you did. The turn of your countenance I shall never forget. As you said that I could not have addressed you in any possible way that would have induced you to accept me. <laughs> Please do not repeat what I said then. I assure you I have long felt most heartily ashamed of it. I have been a selfish being all my life. As a child I was given good principles, but left to follow them in pride and conceit. Such I was, such I might still have been, but for you, dearest, loveliest Elizabeth.